Welcome. This is Dr. Gary Salton, Chief of R&D and Creator of IOP Technology. This video focuses on the issue of gender equality in engineering education. This textual research blog details the data and the analytical methods that are summarized here. That data includes 155 tenured and tenure-tracked engineering professors that were compared to 285 non-engineering professors. The only significant difference in their information processing approach is that engineers tend to put about 10% more reliance on analysis. This is the IOPT-HA style, which measures short-term behavior. You know, the kind of behavior you notice when you only see a person occasionally. The effect of this posture is an image of the engineering professor as a reasonable and progressive thinker. Now, most things require a sequence of decisions. The output of one decision affects the input of the next. IOP describes and measures these behavioral sequences as patterns. There are four basic patterns that represent different sequences of style application, and engineering professors are only distinguished from other professors by a much lower changer pattern commitment. The changer pattern favors experimentation rather than analysis and earlier research has shown that engineering has a low failure tolerance. Experiments have a high failure rate, so engineering's lower changer pattern is no surprise. However, there is a bit of a surprise in just who is holding what position. Full professors are much less likely to use the experimentally oriented changer pattern, preferring instead to minimize risk using the conservator option. The conservator pattern relies on proven processes applied in a highly reasoned format. And when new ideas are considered, risk is minimized using analysis to search for certainty and optimal results. Professors in the assistant and associate ranks are a different breed. They are virtually indistinguishable from their non-engineering peers. None of the differences even approach academic significance levels and the magnitude of the differences with non-engineering areas are more wiggles than differences. What this means is that surveys of engineering faculty are likely to overstate the willingness of engineering to change. In final analysis, full professors carry a lot more weight than do their lower-level counterparts. However, if these disproportionate influences are ignored, the overall engineering stance can be seen as functionally viable and valuable. This is the strength profile of the behavioral patterns of 3,700 field engineers from all levels, from professional to VP. And this is the profile of the non-engineering professors. The differences are substantial. And this is the pattern profile of the engineering faculty. It is a lot closer to the patterns used in the field, and this proximity matters a lot. It eases communication and helps build trust. Remember, the field practitioner has control of the problems that the professors want to tackle, and they have the resources to actually address them. Well, we have professors using a strategy that is well integrated with its mission, and which has steadily produced an unprecedented string of engineering advances. So, what's the problem? Well, these engineering strategies rely on reusing past experience that has been proven in practice. That's how you get stuff that works, the first time and every time. And in the case of teaching, that past knowledge was developed in classrooms dominated by male students. And we know a lot more today than we did then. We know that there are structural differences in both the physical brain and chemical processes of thought and learning between the genders. And these findings are based on hard science, using objectively verified and measurable qualities. For example, a conclusion in a well-researched article in the Pharmacological Reviews Journal is that, quote, both genders strive to achieve equally optimal performance in cognitive function, but this has to be attained in very different hormonal and genetic environments. So, we have engineering professors applying their proven teaching methods to a different raw material, women. 
This is the equivalent of expecting two different elements on the periodic table to respond to a particular intervention in exactly the same way. Depending on that intervention, it will work, sometimes. But over a long series of interventions, it is bound to fail. And a four-year engineering degree can be considered a series of teaching interventions. And the results of the current teaching strategy are obvious. Engineering ranks at the bottom of all STEM professions. But there is a challenge in correcting this engineering shortcoming. Any gender equity adjustments need to preserve the benefits that we all enjoy as a result of engineering success. And the way to do that is to build data that fits into the engineering professor's preferred highly rational strategy. Experimentation is the logical option. Selectively relaxing the current methods, introducing variants, and testing new options. The resulting gender-relevant data can then be converted to the kind of knowledge engineering professors can understand and work with. The place to start this experimental process is in the introductory engineering courses. And we can start with what we do know. We know that the current method is unsuccessful. We know that this method relies on the analytically structured transmission of knowledge. And we know that rationality informs, but emotion engages. We know that female interest is being generated by the many STEM initiatives underway all over the place. Finally, we know that if we do not engage these women in the introductory courses, we are never going to move that line. So, one likely experiment is to target introductory courses with experiments that actively engage multiple sensory channels while preserving the transmission of rational knowledge in a way that both teaches and engages the students. If we can get the engaged women to sign up for the 200-level engineering courses, we stand a chance of moving that line. But that's not the end of the game. Even if we get them to sign up, we have to teach in a way that produces competent women engineers. Male-female structural and chemical differences may provide some clues as to where to begin. For example, cortisol and epinephrine produce the flight-or-fight response, and some engineering professors try to convert the fight option into learning motivation by using stress as a tool. Now, both genders produce these hormones but men produce more. And women generate higher levels of an accompanying oxytocin that mediates the fight-or-flight response. This creates a new option, reconciliation. Professors did not have to consider this in a class full of men. So, what worked just fine in a world populated by males proves less than ideal when women, the new material, are introduced into the classroom. And even the educational formats used in these classes can be affected by the structural and chemical gender differences. For example, teamwork is a relatively new practice in teaching engineering. Trusted methods have yet to be fully developed by engineering professors. So what often happens is a common objective is assigned to a group, and nothing more. No guidance on leader selection, follower responsibilities, or ways to leverage the different abilities of group members. Since men have seven to eight times more testosterone than do women, what do you think is going to happen? A good bet is that male forcefulness will be put into play, which will limit the women's ability to fully contribute and to learn, and deny men the knowledge of how to effectively guide a mixed gender group. It's a lose-lose situation, but there are ways to address it. A self-serving but nonetheless valid observation is that tools are available to address this issue. For example, IOPT is a non-fluffy leadership and team-building technology that fits with engineering's demand for transparency, accuracy, precision, and reliability. Simply recognizing the issue and using these kinds of tools will go far toward strengthening engineering for both men and women. And we're not done yet. The playing field in engineering is severely unbalanced. 
transitional efforts are needed to smooth women's entry. Mentoring is often mentioned as a potential tool. However, this idea is not likely to be appealing to many engineering professors. They went into engineering to do engineering and not counseling. So, a little more experimentation may be in order. For example, a foundation or association may be induced to provide funding to support counseling. Money to support engineering efforts may be seen as a fair trade for exercising mentoring talent. Passing a little money around to promising women students may also be worth a try. Overcoming biases may be a little easier if someone did not have to worry about paying rent or buying books. These and similar experimental efforts will go far toward leveling the playing field. And once the field is leveled, transitional efforts can be put aside. And nothing in the way of engineering insights or rigor need to be sacrificed in this process. At the end of the day, we all want buildings that stand, cars that start, and pliers that grip. However, success means that society has gained new capabilities. Just as certainly as if engineering had learned to identify and work with a new material on the periodic table. You know, William Gregor's discovery of titanium in 1791 has proven awful handy. The process to extract titanium is not easy. But its value as both a metal and an alloy helps make today's world possible. You can expect nothing less in the future as the talents of women are integrated into the fabric of engineering. It won't be easy, but the payoff is enormous. Thank you for viewing this video. If you would like to learn more about IOP technology, please visit our websites at IOP.com or OEinstitute.org. Both sites have much more information on IOP and the areas where it has or can be applied. Thank you again for your interest in IOP technology.